Mr. Moulton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, both of you, for, for joining us today. Uh, Ukraine is winning the war that Russia started by invading their country illegally, in part because we have assembled a remarkable coalition of allies, the best we've seen since World War II. We've provided them with extraordinary weapons and capabilities. And of course, the Ukrainian fighting spirit is something that the world is admiring. The problem is that all three of those factors have come to the forefront after Putin invaded. And so we have to admit that for everything that's going well in Ukraine, deterrence failed. And I certainly agree with the chairman and ranking member that we cannot let deterrence fail in the Pacific. So can you talk to me about how our preparations to be more resilient in the face of Chinese regress aggression are actually translating into deterrence? How are we showing China that these exquisite capabilities we are developing, often very much behind the scenes, are going to severely impact their ability to conduct a, civil, uh, a successful war? You raise the important point about preparations and also the important point about signaling and what it is that we convey and demonstrate to the CCP and how that affects their perceptions um, of our intentions and therefore are or are not deterred. I would start by pointing out that when we think about a strategy of deterrence, we have to begin from the presumption of failure. We have to accept that failure is likely to some greater or lesser extent, and therefore we have to design our strategies of deterrence with two things in mind. The first is, when the strategy fails, what position does it leave the United States in? And the second is, uh, are there things that we can do to decrease the likelihood of that failure? Um, in regard to Taiwan, the fundamentals of both of those things right now are still sound. Adding capabilities, whether behind the scenes or in full public view of the CCP, fundamentally won't change the nature of the dynamic, where it's clear that we are not giving uh, Beijing a free pass, and we're also not giving Taipei a blank check. Um, and so I'm not concerned that we need to demonstrate capability at this point in any greater extent than we have. What we need to do is convey cohesion. We need to convey confidence that we understand what's happening in the strait. Uh, and we need to exude calm and confidence in, in the role that we have in preserving peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Ambassador Harris. Yeah, I'll associate myself with everything that Dr. Sisson said. I'll also add to it that the PRC uh, is a learning machine. Xi Jinping, if nothing else, uh, is watching and learning about what's happening in, in Ukraine. And I, I think he's got to be wondering if his army, which is trained in the Soviet model, uh, is as bad as Russia's army appears to be, if his navy uh, is as weak as the Black Sea fleet appears to be. And I'll, I'll just add, you know, if he'd have gone to my alma mater, he would have known that lesson one is don't lose your flagship. Uh, and and uh, so he'd be, he, he's got to be thinking about that. And he's got to be thinking if his generals are as bad as the Russian generals uh, are want to be. Thank you very much. Let me get a, a second question here. There's increasing evidence that China is facing a demographic and economic cliff in the coming years. If that is true, does it make it more or less likely that Xi Jinping does something rash and aggressive? I unfortunately don't have a great answer to that. I've been uh, studying the behavior of my husband for 20 years. I'm the world's foremost expert, and I still get it wrong 30% of the time. Um, I think that, that you're right to identify that the CCP is sensitive to conditions, that this is not an inevitability because they are aware of the environment in which they operate, the resources that are, that are at their disposal. And so we'll have to pay close attention to all those conditions and go to the experts in the intelligence community for their assessment of how she is interpreting them. Yeah, I, I think the only answer to that question is in hindsight, because there are, there are um, a lots of folks that are weigh in on either side of that. So we're going to have to just prepare to fight tonight to use something I said before. The PRC is also facing a demographic cliff. You know, just this year, they've been surpassed by India as the world's most populous country. And so that's another driver behind some people who would say that the likelihood that China will attack Taiwan is sooner rather than later. 
Well, there are a lot of differences between Russia and China, but it seems like there could be a frightening analogy here, or a comparison, or a parallel, rather, between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Nebraska, General Bacon.